Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ashley Albies. I'm an attorney down in Portland, Oregon. I also have an OFAC license. One of my clients, um, I'm involved with a litigation challenging an OFAC designation um, as a specially designated global terrorist organization. Part of that litigation is also um, a nonprofit out of Southern Oregon called the Multicultural Association of Southern Oregon had their own First Amendment claim based on um, the, you know, not not material support in the context of the criminal statute, but material support in the context of also being designated for providing the material support to a designated organization. And I'll talk a little bit about the designation process and the process of challenging designations um, a little bit later. Um, but initially I want to talk about the raids that occurred on September 24th by the FBI. They raided two homes in Chicago, five homes in Minneapolis, and the anti-war committee office in Minneapolis as well. And um, these groups were doing solidarity work in Palestine and Colombia and were very active anti-war groups. Um, some of the folks involved had been organizing the anti or the counter demonstrations to the Republican National Convention in St. Paul in 2008. Um, the FBI showed up armed to the teeth, threatening everybody, turned um, people's homes, executed search warrants upside down, took computers, cell phones, documents, newspapers, photos, children's artwork, boxes of evidence got carried out of these homes. A total of 14 anti-war um, and interna international solidarity activists in Minnesota, Illinois, and Michigan were subpoenaed to appear in front of a grand jury that was set to be in Chicago in the early part of October. Um, is everybody here familiar with grand juries? I know that there has, I talked to some people earlier about their prior experience with grand juries. Does everybody have a basic idea of what grand juries are, show of hands. Just go through a, a very general few facts about grand juries is um, in the federal legal system, they're used to decide whether or not somebody should be charged or indicted for a serious crime. Um, the, the grand jury, which is composed of um, jurors just like a regular jury, except they're not screened for any kind of bias as we do with jury trials. Um, the jury hears evidence that's presented by the prosecutor. Um, in the federal system, it's the U.S. attorney. Uh, the grand jury can use subpoenas to gather evidence. It can subpoena documents, physical evidence, and witnesses to testify. Um, it also operates in secret. So these um, subpoenas are served, and there's, it's not necessarily public that they have been served or that there is a um, grand jury convened. Um, because of they have very broad subpoena powers that are related to certain kinds of crimes, and as Shane just said, the um, expansion of the crime of material support in relation to support for um, designated organizations, um, that subpoena power has gotten even broader, broader uh, in relation to those sorts of crimes. Um, the purpose of the grand jury isn't to de determine guilt or in, in, um, innocence, but just to decide whether there's probable cause to prosecute somebody for a felony crime. So where we have these very broadly defined crimes, um, where it's very hard to nail down exactly what conduct would, um, would fall within the purview or would not, these, um, grand jury subpoenas are, are um, immensely susceptible to, to abuse. Um, it can be a witch hunt, it can be um, an investigation in and of itself, um, and there's very little restriction on um, the use of, of grand jury investigations. Um, defense lawyers are not allowed to be present in the grand jury room and can't pre present any kind of evidence. It's only coming from the prosecutor. Um, but defense lawyers may be, um, may be allowed to sit outside of the grand jury room while the grand jury is questioning a witness, and the grand jury witness may be allowed to consult with a defense witness, um, a defense attorney periodically throughout the process, which is a very important thing for anybody representing um, t uh, witnesses at grand jury, um, in grand jury proceedings to make use of that um, ability to consult with a client in the context of, of grand jury proceedings. Um, the prosecutor in the grand jury may not reveal what occurred in the grand jury room, and witnesses cannot obtain uh, testimony of, a transcript of their testimony. Um, th there's a long history in this country, particularly in the 70s with COINTELPRO in the 80s um, and the Black Panther Party, misusing um, grand jury <laughs> for political purposes, targeting um, activist groups, creating a chilling effect, um, creating strife in the community. Um, a lot of times they tell people not to talk to anybody else about the subpoena that they received. Um, so people show up and they're asked questions about who they know, um, conversations that ha they've had, places they've been without any kind of context as to what the investigation is about and what's going on. Um, 
Grand juries have been used historically to seed the to sow the seeds of fear and mistrust. Um, people often are asked about their First Amendment protected activities, asked about political activities. If they, um, they're instructed that they have the right to invoke their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, but the prosecutor can then offer and authorize immunity um, and compel that person to testify. If the person continues to refuse to testify, they can be jailed for civil contempt and possibly charged for criminal contempt. Um, and with a civil contempt charge, a witness who's refusing to testify can be um, incarcerated for the duration of the grand jury, which can be up to 18 months, and it can be renewed again for, I think, three months uh, periodically. So for folks that have been called to a grand jury and who are resisting and who are really trying to not participate in the grand jury proceeding, um, they risk going to jail. They risk going to jail for a tremendous amount of time if they have jobs and families. Um, and people that rely on them to be home and providing for them on a daily basis, this offer, this is a tremendous hurdle um, for most people who would like to um, ideally resist political oppression and resist the kind of targeting that, that grand juries can bring forth, but, you know, practically speaking, just don't have the capacity to do it. And I'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, our role as lawyers in that process a little bit later. Um, there's a great article on, and, and I'll go through some websites that have additional information. Um, the Just Cause Collective website has a really great overview of the past abuses um, of use of grand juries um, and the use of grand juries additionally since 9-11. Um, in Minneapolis, there's been a lot of reports of the Somali community being specifically targeted. Um, and as we said, with the most recent FBI raids in Chicago, Palestinian activists um, have been tar targeted as well as um, green scare defendants, folks that engage in um, you know, environmental activism have also been targeted by grand jury, um, grand jury uh, subpoenas. And that's, I think, particularly true in the Pacific Northwest, where in Eugene there was, there's been convictions resulting from some of these um, tactics. Um, so Shane talked a lot about the material support statute in the context of criminal indictment and what that means, and that's how it relates to the grand juries. But there's also the chilling effect of um, the designation challenge, it's, uh, or being designation it, it designated itself. So if you provide support um, or you provide you know, coordinated advocacy with a specially designated um, organization, you can be brought up on material support charges. But if you provide support, um, you can also be designated as, as part of the um, administrative process with OFAC. And the, the chilling effect of that is that it's really hard to challenge those designations. As I said earlier, um, two of my clients, or one of my clients is challenging its own designation. Um, and the other client is, is trying to advocate on behalf of, of that entity. Um, the interesting thing about the designation of Al Haramain, a Southern Oregon charity that was also involved with um, a challenge to the warrantless wiretapping program, um, you know, they, they were designated, they, um, challenged that designation to, to OFAC directly through the administrative process. We filed a lawsuit the, challenging the designation process um, on the basis of due process violations, Fourth Amendment, First Amendment. Um, you know, after we filed suit, the <clears throat> Office of Foreign Assets Control redesignated the group based on its relationship to other designated groups. So it becomes this circular argument where um, the designation occurs and the designation is based on another designation, and since we didn't have notice of that at the initial designation, we couldn't challenge that initial designation of the other group. Um, so there's a standing concern raised, and it just turns into this cyclical, um, ironic legal arguments that we're making about um, you know, who's designated, what action has been, is considered illegal when you don't know at the time that you're involved in the action that you're supporting any kind of designated group, because that group is not designated at the time that you're working with that group. So there's notice issues and due process issues involved, and there's also substantial chilling effect on um, groups for who, who want to participate um, and, and advocate on behalf of and with some of these groups. Um, so in response to the September FBI raids, um, the anti-war groups and, and a lot of civil liberties movements responded very quickly, very effectively, and very loudly. Over 60 cities protested. Activists passed out flyers at rallies. Every rally they went to, it seemed like. In Minneapolis, more than 500 people rallied at the FBI offices. People marched in Chicago. Um, there was a national call-in day that was coordinated to the White House um, and shut down Eric Holder's answering service. 
There was um, coordination and discussion and lobbying with uh, representatives in Minneapolis and several Minneapolis um, and Minnesota legislators passed a resolution condemning the raids um, and sent that to the White House. Um, Seattle, I understand there was a, a rally here in Seattle that was very well attended. Um, and these are the sorts of things that in response to this, instead of um, you know, letting the fear you know, drive everybody underground and, and turn on each other, um, people did a tremendous amount of education and outreach and had a coordinated, um, you know, let's talk about this, let's look at this, let's not be intimidated by this, which was really important. Um, so the update on, on the subpoenaed activists, they retained guild lawyers and all 14 sent a letter from the lawyers stating that they would not testify. The assistant U.S. attorney, Brand Fox, told the lawyers that he would withdraw the subpoenas, but he didn't say anything more. So at this point, the subpoenas have been withdrawn. Um, the seized evidence remains seized as far as, I, as far as my understanding is, um, and there's no indication as to why the subpoenas were withdrawn. We don't know whether it was because of the advocacy. We don't know whether it's because they simply stated in an intent not to testify, and at that point, um, once a, an intent is stated by a witness not to testify, um, the government is less likely to go after civil contempt if they don't think that will force the person to testify. So the stronger the assertion is by any potential witness that they will not cooperate, um, that theoretically less likely they could be subject to contempt proceedings, civil contempt proceedings. Um, the government still has a number of options um, with regard to further action in, in, in these investigations. They can do more raids, they can make arrests, they can issue new subpoenas, they can offer immunity to people, as I said before, with the threat of jail if they don't speak. Um, and for the time being, we've gotten reports of the FBI continuing to harass other anti-war activists at their home and work trying to divide and intimidate them. So part of what we want to talk about is how can we, you know, warm it up, resist the chilling effect. Um, and part of it is having forums like this. Part of it is um, learning what kind of advocacy we can engage in and advise our, our clients what type of advocacy they can engage in. But it's also, um, you know, doing outreach and education to communities that are concerned that they might be targeted or have been targeted about what their rights are. Because the, you know, at, for anybody who's been through a Know Your Rights training, what's the first thing, the cardinal rule, is you have the right to remain silent, and you now have to affirmatively tell um, any officers that you have the right to remain silent. And the purpose is, is twofold, not only to you know, prevent yourself from giving information that might lead to um, further arrest, further intimidation, but it's also that a felony offense to make any kind of misrepresentation to a federal officer. So a lot of times when people are approached and they see a badge or they see somebody who's in a position of authority, you know, a gut reaction is to deny that there's any kind of wrongdoing. And even if they're asked a slight, uh, fairly innocuous question and they give a false answer, that can then be used as a, a threat, a charge, that we're going to charge you with this unless you cooperate. So it's always better to advise your clients to uh, remain silent, invoke the right to an attorney. Um, say that you want to speak to an attorney, you don't want to talk to anybody without an attorney, get their, you know, tell people to get business cards. But a really important um, function of what we can do as lawyers is be supportive of uh, community members when they have concerns and they're very fearful about what's going on if they're targeted. We can help them um, do their own trainings in their own communities. Um, we can do trainings for them, that sort of thing. Um, of course, we can never advise clients to break the law, to lie to any officers, anything like that. So you have to be very clear and concise about the advice that you're giving. Um, you know, there's the Guild always, and, and several groups, a lot of groups, I know in Seattle and Portland in particular too, have a series of ongoing Know Your Rights trainings that deal with these issues. So broadening those um, trainings to include the basic grand jury trainings. Um, the Midnight Special Law Collective has a really great set of materials on their website that talk about grand juries, what to expect, um, how to best resist grand juries, and a lot of it is education and outreach. Um, in addition to the legal stuff that, the legal specific type of claims that Shane talked about. Um, and also, the other thing I want to point out is being aware of the grand jury process, how it works, the investigative process, being familiar with wiretap laws, being familiar with surveillance laws, and being really, um, having an understanding of the comprehensive investigative tools at the government's disposal. Um, they can use informers, they can use, you know, confidential informers without a warrant, they can use um, uh, undercover officers, they can monitor public meetings, um, they can 
fairly easily get access to electronic communications and other types of communications um, by seeking warrants, which are very usually very freely given. So being aware of, of the level and the scope of tools that the government has isn't intended to you know, further chill everyone. It's intended, you know, uh, lawyers having a comprehensive understanding of that, is, is working with our clients to be smart about who they communicate with and how they communicate with, and how easily certain things can be misconstrued when people don't know, you know if they don't know that there's um, an investigation going on and they make a statement that's fairly innocuous, that it can be misconstrued and then used and built upon if somebody agrees to talk to um, a, an officer without an attorney present. Um, so that's some of the things that we need to, to talk to our clients about, talk to our communities about that, that rely on us for protection. Um, you know, as I said, out, outreach, participate in public meetings, discussions. Um, if, if there's materials that you have access to, disseminating those materials. A lot of the grand jury resistance materials are in, are in different languages. Um, the, the other aspect is for folks that are not U.S. citizens being aware of the consequences of, you know, the additional um, impl Im implications of not having U.S. citizenship status um, for folks that are targeted by the FBI and by other federal agencies. Um, and the other part is uh, supporting activists that are doing uh, and supporting other grand jury resistors. So if, some, if, if somebody decides not to testify, um, you know, as I said, they're good, they could face civil contempt and jail time um, and allowing the community to organize and support those people being separated from their families, being separated from their jobs um, and helping to, you know, ease that and, and um, disseminate information about the process so that it's not as terrifying and not as scary. It's like when you're talking to children, you're supposed to tell them what to expect so that they aren't as freaked out when something happens. Um, so it's, it's using that process and using our um, ability to communicate with communicate information about the legal system. Um, the the uh, response to the raids most recently also, also included a tremendous amount of organizing effort. Um, several unions and uh, nonprofit groups have come out with statements and resolutions specifically condemning the raids and have made them public. Um, there's, a, I think, a website that has spoken out um, the uh, or has a compilation of, of the most comprehensive uh, compilation of materials is stopfbi.net. Um, as I said before, the Just Cause Law Collective website has a tremendous amount of background materials um, that it's important to know how it's been used in the past. So if we see these patterns repeating, we know what to expect um, this time around. There's the Grand Jury Resistance Project out of San Francisco or out of Oakland. Um, there's the Midnight Special website who, uh, that also has additional materials. CCR's book on um, when an agent knocks is an excellent resource um, for attorneys, for community members. Um, it's available online, so disseminating that information. And the NLG are, currently has an emergency hotline for targets that's up on the Chicago NLG website, and I believe it's on the Guild website itself. Um, if you're approached as an attorney by somebody who's seeking um, information or, or a potential client or community member that feels that they're being targeted or if they've been visited by the FBI and you feel, um, you know, out of your league, contact other guild lawyers who have been doing this kind of work um, and they can help you through this process. But it's really important to be a resource to the community that's being targeted. Um, I think that's, that's kind of the, the bulk of what, what I wanted to talk about. I mean, I think a lot of people here have had experience with grand juries. Um, since the 70s, it's been a lot harder to be, um, you know, advocate more fully for grand jury resistance. There's a lot of restrictions on what we as lawyers can do, but providing information about the process, about how people can resist more fully, um, you know, without violating our ethical requirements is where I think lawyers are going to be very helpful and can, are right now and continue to be um, throughout this process in resisting it. Um, in terms of, I just want to add a, a quick um, follow up on what Shane had said, um, the OFAC, um, Office of Foreign Assets Control, has a licensing um, program and there's a guide online about the licensing. It's not all that helpful. Um, what it is illustrative of is how vague and how um, kind of out there everything is. And to, you know, Part of you know the mantra that we've been promoting, the mantra we've been hearing is once we silence ourselves, once we 
are afraid to represent people, and once we stop representing people, that's just the same thing as you know turning people over to um, the government for questioning for investigation. I mean, it's our role as lawyers to help protect people through this process um, and not let the chilling effect um, keep people silent or have or force people to um, cooperate with a process that they inherently are are going to be screwed over by. Um, so that's that's my talk. And if anybody has questions. We should have a lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you.